Well, after months of work, the E-Flight 1.2 meter Corsair is finally done. So this has been a complete uh, repaint detail and a lot of work to take the E-Flight 1.2 meter Corsair, the F4U-4 version, and backdate it to this F4U-1A version that flew um, with the Jolly Rogers in November 1943. And I decided to use uh, Ike uh, Kepford's uh, Corsair. Uh, Kepford actually was uh, local, he was from Muskegon, Michigan. So he was actually somewhat of a um, kind of a hometown hero, you could say. And he was one of the leading aces in World War II um, for the Navy and flew with the Jolly Rogers. Now you're just saying is, hey, wait a minute, I see a number seven on here and I thought Kepford flew number 29. Well, that is correct. However, in my months of research prior to building the aircraft, um, I was able to determine that in November 1943, in the Jolly Rogers' first tour of operation, and Kepfer's very first tour as well uh, with the Corsair, that he actually flew uh, white number seven, and uh, not white number 29, he flew white number seven, and he has his uh, four kills, which are uh, shown here on the, uh, on the fuselage, and this would have been about uh, late October, early November 1943. So it was still very early in his career, he was not even ace yet, um, he went back on leave, or went on leave in Australia, and when he came back from that, he was assigned White 29, which was later shot up. Uh, the ammunition actually exploded in the wing and destroyed the aileron and the flap, and uh, he had a crash landed at the airstrip, and that aircraft was a write-off. And his replacement aircraft, uh, which was also number 29, is the one that everybody knows. That's the one that all the models are made out of. There's even been some RC models made of that, static models. That's the most famous um, of Kepfer's plane. It's been well photographed, well documented. But in 1943, he flew this particular Corsair here, number seven. So thanks to Cali for, uh, for helping me out here because we were able to uh, uh, change my order uh, from number 29 back to number seven here so that I could properly represent this aircraft. And from what I found, there's only one picture of Kepford sitting in plane number seven with his four kill markings. And so that's what I use as the basis for my project. And if you remember from the, the rest of my series, um, there was quite a bit of effort made to backdate the airframe. There's a lot of differences between the Dash 4 model and the Dash 1A. Dash 4 model was very late war, actually probably even a little uh, after the war, and the 1.2 meter Corsair came in a Marine Corps training squadron uh, scheme, and uh, that wasn't gonna work for me. I, were, I really wanted to backdate this into uh, something different. So I'm gonna take a tour around the aircraft and kind of highlight some of the changes that I made. And um, if you've been watching the video series, it should, none of this should really be any surprise because I've documented pretty much everything that I have done to take this Corsair from the Dash 4 model with the, uh, the green and white stripes and the Marine logos on it, and turning it into the model you see here. So let's go ahead and uh, get started here. We'll start right up at the uh, at the nose here. And if you notice, it's got a, a three-bladed prop on here rather than the four-bladed prop that came uh, with the model originally. This is actually a T28 prop, the 1.2 meter uh, E-Flight T28 prop that the, uh, the tips have been rounded down, uh, cut and sanded. Um, I don't know if I'll actually fly on this prop or not. This might just be a static prop. Uh, I don't necessarily uh, trust my balancing on this all that much because I had to do a lot of cutting on it. Plus the blades are a little bit fatter in proportion to the, uh, the length. So I'm still working on the details of the prop, but at least I have now a three bladed prop uh, versus the four bladed prop that came with the factory. The four blade prop was a little too small of a diameter and also would not have been correct for the, uh, the Dash 1A. You have to use a spacer if you use a different prop uh, because the factory prop has a spacer built into the hub adapter and so you have to space the prop out a little bit further in order to make that work. I've also detailed the, uh, the dummy radial engine that sits behind the, uh, the propeller here. It's been completely painted and weathered. I, I actually went down to the, uh, the Kalamazoo Air Zoo Museum and, and photographed uh, a couple different Corsair motors. They have one in a Corsair and they have another that's on a stand. And I was able to photograph that and replicate most of that as best I could. Um, in here. So it gives it quite a bit more depth in the uh, the nose rather than just having a black dummy radial. Uh, by painting it, it gives it more depth, gives it something of interest to look at in the nose and really helps bring that area uh, to life. Moving back down a little bit further, uh, we're going to get into the, um, to the exhaust area. And the Dash 4 had a set of exhaust 
uh, stacks uh, located about here underneath the, uh, the cowl flap and then I had another set uh, down below. I've since uh, taken those out, I, I removed them uh, completely, which was not easy, uh, so I didn't damage the, uh, the foam cowl flaps. I pulled them out, and then there was a, a recess in the fuselage here where the exhaust pipe had, had exited. And so that's all been filled and then painted over uh, so that it no longer shows that that is there. And then underneath, um, I took uh, some plastic tubing and made the uh, the three exhaust stack or three exhaust ports for each side. So there's six total on here, and they are actually underneath the uh, the aircraft. Um, probably about the uh, probably like the five seven o'clock position on the bottom of the cowl, and then I weathered those and gave them a kind of a rusted metal look, and then did all the exhaust standing underneath. That's one of the signature features of the Dash 1A was having the exhaust pipes down below. And something I really had a lot of fun uh, putting those in and then weathering it so that from underneath, uh, you get that real nice um, exhaust streak and everything that goes down on the white paint. The entire aircraft was uh, painted in uh, Tamiya AS series colors. Uh, it's the dark blue, the intermediate blue, and uh, the insignia white. Um, I find that it took a lot more cans of paint than I had thought. But the quality of paint and the way it laid down, you know, to me, it looks absolutely uh, wonderful. I'm really, really happy with how the, uh, the paint quality turned out on this aircraft. And uh, part of the reason for, of course, the repaint was is that the, the solid dark blue was used um, at the end of World War II and then in Korea and in the kind of the interwar war years. So the, the marine scheme that it came with was correct, but in order for me to backdate the airframe, I needed to repaint it. Plus with filling, uh, like this area in here where the exhaust was, taking off all the decals, um, it was going to need a complete uh, repaint. And so I'm really happy with how the Tamiya paints work uh, for this. The only bad thing is you need a lot more paint than you, uh, than you think, so you're going to definitely need to stock up on uh, cans of paint if you're going to do the same thing like you did on mine. Uh, moving down uh, a little bit further here, we're going to get into the, uh, the oil uh, cooler area. And for this here, I actually um, had Kelly uh, take a picture of the oil cooler mesh and build me that screen mesh in a decal. And I put that inside the, um, the oil cooler inlet. And then there's all the individual uh, turning vanes that I made out of um, thin plastic. And then I used a pair of uh, tweezers and actually glued each one of those turning vanes into the, uh, the oil cooler area to kind of give that a little bit more realism, a little bit more depth. Um, not one of the more fun projects by any means, cutting all those little pieces, and uh, I had a lot of scrap that didn't, didn't work out on those. But they're all in there now, and it really adds a level of realism to that area. It's one of them, kind of another one of those defining features of the Corsair, this gull wing with the, uh, the oil coolers mounted in that uh, downward swept area. So I was really excited to detail that in this model and kind of give it that, uh, that area to come to life. Moving out to the uh, the gun ports, um, the factory just has uh, the three openings with nothing in them. Uh, what I did is I took some plastic tubing, just some small diameter tubing, and actually pressed that inside the uh, the gun ports, and then I staggered them so that they're actually uh, staggered correctly as they would be on the aircraft. Because obviously the the guns are not all in line; they are staggered so that the um, the next um, um, uh, ammunition belt can feed the next gun and then the next one staggered down from that so that ammunition belt so all three ammunition belts come out in a row and then they exit to the uh, each individual gun so each one of those ports has been uh, filled and uh, given a, uh, um, a little fake machine gun built out of uh, plastic tubing I also added the uh, kind of the stall flap here uh, it's just a piece of uh, plastic um, kind of angle that I pushed into the foam. I don't know how well that's going to work or not. It may may actually be a little bit of a detriment, but that's one of the features that the Jolly Rogers actually helped develop uh, for the Corsair. Uh, they were one of the very first uh, uh, squadrons that had the Corsair, and they were actually going to be the very first one to use it in, uh, in carrier operations and actually got it qualified for carrier ops. And there's a lot of modifications that happened between the uh, the Dash 1 and the Dash 1A Corsair that are a direct result of the input from the Jolly Rogers working with the uh, the chance fought uh, engineers. And this little uh, stall piece here was one of them. That helped prevent the aircraft from stalling violently and, and, uh, and rolling. So I've added to the model. I don't know if it's really going to do anything or not, um, but it's neat to have it there because it would be correct to have it in its place. Uh, continuing moving out on the wingtips, I did add um, navigation lights. Um, I cut 
the uh, the end of the, the foam off and found a, uh, a piece of a wingtip light from another model that happened to fit almost perfectly. So then I cut a trench down the um, down each wing on the bottom and then ran the uh, the navigation lights out to the ends of the wing. Uh, that also will help a lot with orientation. And one of the reasons I really want to paint the aircraft was to help give it orientation. Um, the solid dark blue, I have that in my other Corsair. Uh, my Corsair S is all solid dark blue with the yellow uh, cowl on it. And in certain lighting conditions, it's actually really difficult to see. So by giving this some different color variations and the navigation lights, I'm hoping to really help see the aircraft just a little bit better. Plus, I think navigation lights just look cool anyway. Uh, I have them pulled on, uh, put on a plug on the receiver so I can actually unplug them if I don't want to use them or plug them back in so that uh, I have the lights on it. Obviously, in combat conditions, they're not going to be flying around with the navigation lights, so it gave me the option to uh, turn those on or off. Uh, continuing moving around the aircraft here, um, I get to one of my favorite pieces of, the, of this project, and that was the cockpit. Uh, this is the very first time that I ever detailed a cockpit to this level. I mean, I've done a little work here and there, a little paint work, but I've never gone through and did the level of detail work I did on this one. So to start with, um, I took the pilot out and I gave him a more authentic um, U.S. Navy Pacific uh, uniform. I painted the, uh, his helmet more of a khaki color. His uh, flight suit is khaki. I added the yellow for the, um, for the Mae West Life Preserver, the, uh, the light tan straps for his parachute, and actually built, um, built a uh, set of harnesses for him using uh, masking tape. I also moved the pilot back a little bit. I thought the pilot was a little bit too far forward in the cockpit. So I moved him back. And then I also designed a, uh, a seat and a rear bulkhead and headrest. Um, and I had those 3D printed and then glued them into place. So now he's sitting in the cockpit a little bit more correct for how you would normally sit inside the, uh, the Corsair. And I tell you, it really adds a level of realism just looking at the pilot figure in here with him painted in more of a U.S. Navy scheme, sitting properly in the cockpit with the headrest, the seat, and the, uh, the harnesses coming through. I also took that opportunity to detail the, uh, the dash. Um, I went through and 3D printed and designed up the, um, the instrument cluster and put holes in it where all the gauges went, laid down a piece of, uh, of clear plastic, and then put a, uh, the set of gauges behind that, sandwiched it all together, glued it into place, and then added a uh, reflector gun sight. I actually made a gun sight with a reflector dome on top of it. And I also, there is a, a little box with uh, some toggle switches on it on the right side of the instrument panel. I made that as well. I don't know exactly what that does, but um, I found a piece of uh, balsa and some pieces of plastic and I was able to fabricate uh, that little control panel as well. And then part of the, um, the reflector gun sight is actually the uh, reflector housing or reflector panel that sits on the um, up on the uh, the windscreen here, um, and so I built that out of clear plastic and painted it and added a little uh, gun sight in there, which is orange for the where the reflector points up at, and then around the uh, the windscreen here to help give it the look of armored glass, I actually painted uh, the perimeter of it in uh, transparent green, so it helps make it look as if it's a. Uh, visually thicker. And then the entire uh, canopy area here, I highly polished it with um, Tamiya polish. Uh, they have a, uh, two different types of polish and it really gives it a very crystal clear look and a shine to it. And it helps offset some of the dull um, flat paint that is on here. It kind of gives you something else to kind of look at here in the airframe. Otherwise, electronic wise, um, I did go through and replace all the servos with, uh, with Metal Gear servos. However, everything else electronics wise is, is completely stock in here. So no sense of taking the, uh, the the battery tray off. It's still a little bit of a rat's nest of wiring in here, um, but I did run all new uh, servos in here and they're all plugged into the uh, receiver. Uh, really not much else in terms of detail back here besides just the uh, the paint scheme. And I did add the um, all of the uh, nomenclature decals here from uh, from Cali as well. They're, they're very difficult to see, which is exactly how they're supposed to be. You're not supposed to see them that clearly, but all the uh, markings are on here for like the, where the ammunition goes, where the access panels are, electrical service, oil service, everything like that. All of those decals are on here. And those, be surprised, it takes a lot of time to get all those little decals in, but it adds a lot of realism to the aircraft. 
Um, underneath, not much really uh, to talk about other than I did paint the landing gear uh, white with uh, the silver strut, which would be correct for this vintage aircraft. Um, I did think about actually building little gear doors for it, but opted against that. I don't really have that uh, the ability to do that well. I will not be using the drop tanks on this Corsair that came with it. And the reason is because they didn't have drop tanks for the uh, the Dash 1A. In fact, I, I was actually going to build a bomb mechanism for it uh, to use the same bombs that the P-47 uses. But um, in November of 43, they didn't have the ability to drop bombs. So I, I went without that um, for this aircraft. This is uh, It was strictly really a fighter and uh, used for strafing operations with six machine guns and no bombing and no fuel tanks. So the aircraft will sit fairly clean in comparison to the P-51, which I can hang uh, drop tanks, 500 pound bombs and, and rocket tubes on. This will be a much cleaner airframe without anything on it. So uh, it's been a very fun project. It took um, about five, uh, five months total to uh, complete it. And that's working on it uh, almost every single day to do all the paint work, detail work, uh, the cockpit, everything. Uh, all the weathering. It's been a it's been a fun project. It's been a challenging project, but extremely rewarding. It's one of my favorite airplanes, and I love it in, in this beautiful Jolly Rogers 1943 uh, scheme. So if you have any questions, by all means, leave them in your comments below. I'm more than happy to help out on this. Um, like I said, there's a lot of work to it. Most of it's all been covered in the um, in the in the rest of the series of videos on this particular project. Um, but there's all sorts of little things I did that uh, probably didn't make the video and I probably uh, didn't talk about even in this here. So if you've got any questions on it, by all means, uh, leave them in your comments uh, below. The next step for this thing is to um, clean up the wiring inside here a little bit, inside the battery tray. Uh, go through a complete pre-flight, set the center of gravity, get ready to fly it, and then I continually work on exactly what propeller I want to use. Um, I still want to use the stock power system, stock ESC, so I'm kind of limited to exactly what prop. I cannot get to a scale prop, which would be about 13 inches in diameter. So I'll have to play around with it a little bit and try to find that right balance between performance, scale, and um, in size. So uh, that wraps up the, uh, the Corsair project here for, uh, for Ike Kepford's white number seven during his first tour in uh, November 1943. So... Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, wrapping this thing up, wait for springtime and get it in the air. So we'll talk to you guys later.